Uh, cool. We're going to start. And uh, since this is my second talk, most of you already know me. I'm Nate. Um, and uh, please interrupt with questions. When you, when you have questions, just raise your hand and um, we'll, do, we'll go right like that. So to start, I would like everybody to stand up because uh, there's been a huge party yesterday and I want to get some oxygen into your, into your brain, so stand up. <laughs> also, the, the real reason is, is uh, I keep standing up if you have seen uh, my Plone API talk already, last year in Brazil or, or last year in Arnhem. So keep standing up if you have seen the talk. Okay, so I, I just want to know if I need to skip some parts. I don't. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about how Plo development w went to a really dark place for me and what we're now doing to bring it back. Um, I started uh, working with Plone as a student in 2006 when me and Garbas were in a student organization called Eastec. And uh, Eastec is a pretty big organization. Uh, we have a lot, uh, thousands of, of members and a lot, a lot of events, and we needed a, a system to manage these events and to apply and then to have participation applications and then the whole workflow of how you uh, uh, confirm or deny a, a participant. And we thought Plone was a really cool idea to do it. Um, so ISTE has a lot of electrical engineering students uh, as members, right? And after so this 2,500 potential planistas, how many did we did we manage to keep in the Eastec IT team developing Plone? That many, myself and Domen, I electric. Well, no, Domen is not active anymore. Yeah, so actually one. So it, it's 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 a real shame that we have this huge, huge base of potential students coming into the Plone community and we just cannot use it. And I think that the main reason is this because we switched to Plone three. Uh, in, in, in the meantime, and then, then that just caused us a ton of problems. Like, uh, it was, Plone 3 is impossible to train for if, if you're training students. Um, it's really hard to write docs because you have to have like docs like this for a simple task because if there's this exception, you have to know this, you have to know that, that. and there's the old way and the new way. Um, and y you cannot stay productive, and that just makes you sad, and you just walk away and say, screw this shit. Um, Plone 4 did make things better, but numerous problems still exist. Uh, for example, you're always questioning, like, where do you import that thing already? Um, uh, like, show of hands, who knows from where, where you import get tool by name? Okay. But that's only a third, and it's the thing you use in every single piece of your Plone code. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, like there are a ton of ways to get the site route and which one is the correct and how what should I use? And you go into Google and like have like ten results and like, Ugh. and I, I like I, I I do a lot of consulting. I did a lot of consulting about through in various plum companies and they all have you know uh, their internal cheat sheets on the on on the walls and like why <laughs> it should be obvious you know and then like, copying and moving objects. Seriously? Manage underscore paste objects and then... <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> and the workflow state, I always have to look that one up. Like, I just want to, like, is, is it this private or is this published? And you have to have something like this to, to get it. And it's just, again, on the wall and then t typing it down. Um, so yeah, it's really bad. Um, and like, this, this were the main reasons why we couldn't keep uh, students in, in, in the Plone community and they, they went on to do whatever they, they, they want to do. And um, here the Plone API comes in. Uh, um, elegant and simple API for humans wishing to develop with Plone. Um, the whole idea started at the Plone conference in Munich 2012, so that's about a year and a half ago. And uh, uh, it was after Elise uh, led this talk, and we started talking, and we, we did a, f uh, a few a few proof of concepts, and uh, then the thing picked up, and we had a beer sprint in Antwerp, again organized by ISTEC, the student organization, 
and we did an alpha release there uh, of Plone API. And the thing is that we had about half of students and half of, of, of Plone people. And um, I was basically training students how to do a Plone 4 version of the ECA.NET portal. And when, there was a st when they were stuck with something or something was really complex, we were like, uh huh, we need the Plone API method for that. And then I went to the Plone side of the room and like, guys, do it. Like, and do it in one hour because we need it. And then at the end of the event, we had uh, like the basic uh, skeleton up, and it was already working. Um, following was the Plone conference in Arnhem, not 2013, but 2012. Um, and we had a beta release, and then another uh, almost uh, already a release candidate at Munich with lots of refinements. And at this point, uh, we have more than 30 committers already in Plone API, so it's gaining momentum. Um, the inspiration for Plone API were all these fine um, documents and principles. Uh, we, we took a look at libraries that we thought uh, are doing it good, and we tried to model after them. Um, so with the, with, with the Plone API, from, from where to import that thing, you, you always do this. You always, from Plone, import API, and that is the only import uh, line that you have to memorize. It's always like this. Uh, and then coming to how, how to get the site root, it's api.portal.get. Uh, copying and moving objects instead of this chunk of code. Uh, you have something like this. Uh, api.content.move or api.content.copy and just give it a source and a target and it's going to do it. Uh, the workflow state, instead of this four lines, uh, you have api.content.getState or transition. And yeah, the huge thing about Plone API is it's documented. And we basically start with documentation first. Uh, after the first, the, the, first uh, the initial push in, in, in Munich, we had the documentation written, but no code was written. So we had the narrative documentation of how you, how you would use Plone API was actually defined, written, everything was done, and no code was done. And that enables us to change the, the API and like, how, how the methods would look like, how would we use it very fast because there were no, you know, uh, um, there was no code already that you would then have to throw away and you're like, no, nah, but we already have this, maybe we should not change it. So yeah, documentation first was a great idea. And then when we came into, in, in Bel into, into Belgium, uh, a few months later, we, like, the doc documentation was written. It was, that was also the specs, so just, just the coding. It was really fast. Um, Plone API comes with narrative documentation that that only gives you the basic examples of how you would use it and like in, in a nice structured way you can just flo flow through them through it and see how you would use it. Uh, but then if you if if you click on any of this, um, I mean all, all of this narrative documentation also links you to the advanced documentation, where uh, the entire uh, the entire API uh, uh, is specced and you have. A documentation for every parameter, what happens if you do this, and you, like this covers the full the full uh, use case of the Plone API. Um, also, the code itself, and if you look at the source, has really good comments. Uh, like the, for example, I took one of the methods that it's really documented. Like, why are we calling? What is this old like? What is this code doing? Because a lot of the times when you're looking through old source, Plone source or Zop source, there's there's this chunk of code, and you're like, what the f what's going on? Like. What, what is this here? And I really uh, strive to, uh, so to push everyone to, when, when they're discovering how to, for example, do a adopt user method, document your, your discovery. So the next time we're going to have to do it, we can go here and read, like, why is this like it is? Like it is. Um, it's tested. Uh, we have 99% test coverage. Basically, it's 100. We just have to sprinkle a few no, no QA <laughs> comments around. Um, and also, the narrative documentation that I showed you previously, the, you know, the, the story, though that, that examples are also tested. So we know that that documentation is actually valid code, and it, it runs. So if you copy it in your, in your, in your, in your shell, it will actually work. Um, and on every commit, that get pushed to GitHub. We have uh, builds. Uh, we have we run build on on Travis. So like we always know that uh, the latest code is good and all the tests pass and all the syntax validation tests pass. So how would you use uh, Plone API? So you like I said, you from Plone import API, uh, and then uh, you would 
get a, a group, so for this in this example, portal, and then a method. And we have five different groups. You have uh, portal, content, users, groups, and env as environment. The API, the API portal gives you a these methods. So you have get, get navigation root, uh, which is uh, language aware. You have get tool. So instead of uh, from products.cmf core, I think, it's in something. Utils, import get tool by name, and then get tool by name, and then parentheses, and the context, and uh, the name of the tool. You just do uh, API portal get tool and just give it the name of the tool because it will get the context from like, from the from the portal. So the, the get tool, we, fir we first, get, first get the portal uh, root and then use that as a context. So you don't need to pass the, the self-context into this uh, API method. So it, you lose one one parameter, so it's more concise. Um, localized time, send email. Oh, sending email across prone versions is... <laughs> and like sometimes you have to do it like this, sometimes you have to do it like this. Uh, and also the parameters are not really well named. Uh, here we strive to be like very simple. You can just call this method and do it. Uh, show message will show... Yep. Uh, I think it's secure mail host, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, show message will show uh, this, uh, uh, what they're called notification, like portal notification message, uh, that bar status, yeah. Uh, and then uh, we have get registry record and set registry record, which, which, with, with which you can manage uh, the blown app registry records. So you don't have to, again, import I, I registry from blown app registries and then uh, an I annotation interface. You just you just use this and just tell it. Just give me that, that record as a string, and you're gonna get it back. Uh, you lose like I, th I think three or four lines of importing. Um, the content you have uh, create, get, delete, copy, move, rename, stuff like that. And then you have the get UUID, which will probably get deprecated because you can now just call dot UUID on any content content item. Uh, get view will get you a view, so you will give it a, an object and a view name and a request, and it will give you a view. Um, and then get state and transition, which we already saw be previously, uh, and that's for workflows. The API user, the same as content, you have create, get, uh, delete, and then you have get users, which will give you all users if you don't pass it any parameters, or you can give it a group name parameter and it will just return you the users of that group and the get current will get the currently authenticated user. Um, yeah, then you have is anonymous and then lots of mangling with permissions and roles and, uh, and stuff like that. The group is very similar, the group module is very similar to the user, uh, user module. You have the, again, create, get, create, get, delete um, and wrangling with, with uh, roles, permissions, adding and removing users from the group. The new thing is uh, api.env adopt roles and adopt user, which I'm going to speak about in a second. Uh, so, Plone API in the wild. Uh, there is a tutorial to the app that uses it extensively, so you can see how it works in real life. Uh, I use it personally in a, in a project that has uh, over 100,000 objects and uh, about 1,000 users with absolutely no problems. And a show of hand, who is using Plone API in production? So that's about a third, almost half, which is pretty good. Cool. Um, latest addition from Arnhem, so in the last year, so meaning uh, Munich, what we did in Munich in the, in, in the last 10 months. We killed a lot of bugs that came up with people started to use it in production, which is nice. We now know it's more stable. Uh, then these two uh, API.env methods and uh, a coding style guide, which we'll come back to later. So adopt roles, this is just so amazing for testing because you can use it, you can use it as, a context, uh, as a context measure with the widths. So you would say like, I, I now want to be anonymous and I want to go to this whatever, uh, uh, whatever URL and I want to assert that there's an error and then like, with the manager, there's no error. It's, it's like that much of code in your test in this amount of, uh, like when you use Plone plan API, this is just, <laughs> yeah, it's just, and like, the same with user. Like, I want to be that user and I want to create a content and 
done. Like for testing, like they, your tests just shrink a lot. The second, maybe even more important part of the work we did in the last 10 months is the style guide, which is, has also been included into Plone 5 core, meaning um, the framework team approved this as the deep Plone core style guide, meaning that Plone 5, uh, I mean Plone core from now on should basically look like it says in here. It's quite strict, uh, but um, it will allow us to have the same base so that when you're looking through code, you're not, uh, you don't have to context switch between different styles. You have the same style. Yeah. Is there a linting tool running already? Mm, um, it's pa part of a. So if, if, we are, if we already check for this, not yet, but it's being built. Yeah. Um, the style guide, we base it on PEP8, which is the Python style guide, and we base it on PEP257, which, uh, which defines how doc strings should look like, and then we. Uh, took uh, a few style guides of, of different companies, organizations, and projects um, and, and merged that in. The thing is that we do not duplicate. We, we, we base on this and then just list exceptions out of, from them. So you should first, like whenever you, you're, in, you're, you're reading the Plone API style guides, you first need to, like, it will point you to another document and then just list exceptions to that. So we don't du duplicate effort. Mm. So line length, this was a heavy one. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're now going to enforce the 80 uh, car line length. And um, if you need to break it because uh, the code will look nicer, just append this no QA and uh, all the syntax, text, syntax uh, tests will, will, will pass. So you can still have longer lines if you need them. And it really helps if you configure your editor to have like columns visible at, at 80. Or I have it at 72 and 80 also. Um, and like for me, uh, like my site is not as good as it was. Right? Like, um, and my, in my in my in my in my laptop, um, I I cannot squeeze more than a hundred characters like in my screen. Like when I have it, you know, full screen. So if people write like eighty plus, then you have you know the Git uh, clutter, and then it's, like eighty for me is like really good for my screen. And uh, if people insist to go over a hundred or maybe even a hundred twenty, like I have to scroll, and that's not nice. Um, then another one that I'm really passionate about is breaking lines because we like to, yeah, plenty. <laughs> uh, we like to like uh, have multiple spaces here and there, and then I, uh, we now define like how lines should be broken. Um, so if you have just one line, just break it into the next one and finish. Um, but if you have multiple lines. You should always have the the closing parenthesis or bracket like in the new line, and then here should also always be a comma because if if a new guy comes in and adds a line, uh, if you don't have a comma, he will have to add a or she will have to add a, a, a comma here, and then you will have changes changes in both lines. And if, if you if you're if you're seeing a diff in, in in on GitHub or whatever, it's you have noise. But if all the lines have commas, you just see ah there was addition of one line, and then that's it. Mm. Doc strings. Uh, this is an example from the from the coding style guide of how a good doc string looks like. You have the. It's based on the PEP 257, like I said. Um, with one exception, we uh, disregard the benevol benevolent dictator's rule of having one empty line here, so we don't use that. Like we just close immediately. Uh, it was a huge debate. And we decided like that, um, and you can see like the, the why like all, all the everything that, that is here you have the reasons listed on on the Plone API style guide. So uh, like it's not because so, but we actually have reasons for that. Um, so the title should be in, in first person, and it should be 80, 80 characters, not not more, not in two lines, just one line, eighty characters, and uh, terminated with a with a full stop. So it looks nice, and then you have the full the, the body. Which uses uh, Sphinx formatting to link to other stuff, and then you should always um, uh, specify like, the parameters and uh, of, of of your of your method or function, and also the return time, return type, and possibly if there are any uh, exceptions raised, when they are raised, and what they mean. And the Plone API source code itself is a good example of this. Uh, we try to make it a good example of this, and uh, also the the documentation that. Uh, the, 
the advanced documentation of Plone API is, is actually generated from the code. And if you if if you write code like this in Plone Core, we can also do that for Plone Core. We can have the full full Plone Core API like generated documentation in one place, and that would be really cool. Um, so you know like what a method does, and if you if you pass it, then what happens? Um, then it's unit test too. We recommend unit test too because there are a lot of changes, and I still see a lot of tests that people write that do not use the new methods uh, that become really helpful in, in unit test too. Uh, but first, some deprecations do not use fail anymore, like fail unless or fail if or whatever. Just use assert and and whatever the method you need to use. And assert equals is now written without the the, the s at the end. Um, yeah, this tiny. Noise reduction thingy. Hmm? One true way. One true way, yes. Um, so because of the, you're not not supposed to use fail. That these are all deprecated now, uh, but you have a bunch of new ones who are which are really cool. Uh, for example, I really like uh, assert in to assert if something is in a list or something is in a dictionary, or something is in a string. And for all of these, you also have. Uh, the negative, so you have assert not in or assert not is or assert is not none. So you have both ways. Mm. And you can assert if, if it's an instance and if dictionary contains a subset and if sequence is equal or items is equal. Uh, I like to use uh, assert items equal to compare like to, to, to lists or to dictionaries that I know will not be in the same order because this will disregard order. So it would just make sure that you have the same set of items in, in one dictionary or in one list and in the other list. It, it's really helpful. It's, you don't have to do sorting in, in, your, in your unit tests. Um, then we have assert almost equal. <laughs> um, also a very useful one is the assert multiline equal which uses diffLib and is really helpful for um, um, comparing like large, possibly Unicode strings and will give you like nice diffs where the changes are. Like, tremendously helpful when debugging your code. Mm. <laughs> and one of my favorites, uh, assert raises can now be used as a context manager. So we can just do with self assert raises type error and then call, call whatever you need to call. And you can also Save the context, man context manager like, at the end, and then you can see what the exception was and what the exception code was. So you can really nicely assert uh, what exceptions are raised and do you catch them correctly or do you raise them correctly. Moving on to string formatting, we prefer the new style of format. Um, so this is good and this is bad. Show of hands. Uh, do we want to drop Python 2.6 support so we can use this? Yeah, yeah, but then Plone API cannot be used in old installations that use 4.2, so it's a thing to discuss. I, I think I would actually prefer to have this as a recommendation. Um, and then if you need to support Python 2.6, you can use this. So I think this needs to be changed a bit. So this is the 2.7 way and this is the 2.6 way. And this one is better because you can then like add here's more stuff or at the beginning and you don't need to change the numbers. So it's less noise again in, in your diff. Uh, again, a huge battle. Imports. So this is how your imports should look like. Uh, you should not import star. Uh, you should not have multiple imports on one line because then some editors don't like that and it's kind of a messy. Uh, they have to be sorted alphabetically. So because Plone has such a huge code base, we don't want to always be, so is this a third party library include or or, or not? And then you, we had a, like, when we did the actual Plone API importing, like the source of import, we, we had like two hour discussion for one import. Is this a third party or not? And we're just like, no, 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 no. Not not a chance. Let's just everything alphabetically done. Uh, the third thing is uh, a lot of code, a lot of code in Plone, in or special Plone add-ons, when they when they when they do conditional imports, they import and then they try, and then they catch an import error, and um, this is this can 
come back later and bite you in the ass really hard. So this is a correct way of doing conditional imports. Yes? Yes. Yes. Yes, uppers first and then yeah, alphabetically and then uppers uppers uh, above, yeah. And there's b because i becomes f to f, we do have a one new line here just to keep it visual. Uh we also define how tracking changes changes should should look like and like the, the format of this because every clone uh, package has a different uh look of 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 the changes that rst file so like this is how it should look like from now on. Uh, yes. Hmm? We can, we can, yeah. Uh, and this is the suggested versioning scheme, the semantic versioning 2.0.0. Um, you can look it up later. Uh, commit messages, again, we just link uh, to Tim Pope's recommendation, and this is, this is his recommendation of how a good commit message should look like. Uh, starting with a title uh, with up to 72 characters, and then the, the, the full body. Uh, there's also th things about string quoting, about uh, how to use Git effectively, how to branch stuff, and also how to release, uh, how, how to have a good release process. Mm. Also, when you scroll through the convention guide, you see a reference to uh, a repository we have in the Plone, Plone organization on GitHub called plone.dotfiles, where various Plone developers uh, have a bazaar for exchanging uh, their dot files, tips and tricks. So if you're just starting up with Git or whatever, check this out and see what everybody else has for the aliases and like share yours also. Um, what's coming up is the uh, more methods in the end of module, like is this debug mode or is this, does anybody know from the top of their hand how to know if you're in the bug mode in Zope? In Plone, because I always spend an hour looking for that. They do not count. <laughs> uh, and then also test mode, if you have some code that does not really run well in test, you could just disable it with, with this one. And, and with Plone version and Zope version and maybe add-ons, listed add-ons, installed add-ons, available add-ons, versions of add-ons. And also this version, should they be the file system version or the installed version or both? Like it's, This one needs more discussion. Uh, it would be really cool to have support for upgrades and uh, the cleanup of all the of broken uh, objects, uh, utilities, interfaces, stuff like that. And a wet dream of every JavaScript loan developer. <laughs> <laughs> so only Garbas in this room. <laughs> uh, like a somewhat of a JSON mapping to the Plone API method, so you have a unique way to, I mean, uh, one preferred way to write your JavaScript commands. Mm. Funny thing, well, whenever we run a build on Travis for Plone API, we actually run it for four times, uh, for Plone 4.2 and 4.3, and against Python 2.6 and 2.7. And sometimes it's just fun to see how, like, how, like the duration of the builds, because like 4.2 on, 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 on 2.6 and 4.3 on 2.7, like almost half a difference, nine minutes and five minutes. It's cool just to look at it. So yeah, we're having a post-conference sprint uh, this weekend. Welcome to join. We're going to implement some of the remaining uh, uh, API methods, try to get the test coverage up to 100% and then comment out with no QA those lines that are actually run in the test but the, the coverage tool does not pick them up. Um would be cool to, to have, uh, again, a native English speaker go through the narrative documentation and see their, their it's, the English is okay. And also, uh, last year we started with uh, Spanish and Portuguese translation for these docs, and they need to be updated because uh, they, the documentation changed. So if you would like to do that, please come. Um, and possibly get a 1.0 stable release out by the end of this week or by the end of the next week in Jao Pessoa. What we need to do uh, at the sprint is uh, currently Plone API is built on read the docs and we need to uh, import a huge amount of ZOAP 
uh, old dependencies and then that breaks builds on read docs often and then we have bro broken documentation on there. So we need to somehow deprecate it and link to api.plone.org. Um, because there we have a build out with and we can control and it, it's always uh, always passes. Also the thing that I would want, I want the, sp the Sphinx warnings to break the build. So if someone goes in and uh, starts typing a documentation and then misses some title or something and there are five warnings and they're pushed and then two months later there are five more and then five more and then I end up cleaning 50. Uh, I want warnings to be errors and that's it. We w we're going to integrate Plone Recipe code analysis. That's what Garbos was asking about. This one already checks for a lot of things, but we need to add more more checks. Coveralls IO um, checks for code coverage. So we want to be able to break the build if test coverage went down. So if somebody added uh, code but did not add tests. Uh, kill some of the various bugs that we still have. There are around 15 issues open. Uh, and proofreading documentation that just go through it and see that it actually does what, uh, it, I mean, the code does what the documentation says that it does. Then there's one more decision we need to take. Should changes RST be in the root or in the docs? I want to have it in the root. A lot of, no, sorry, in the docs, a lot of people want to have it in the root and we kind of like uh, need to reach a consensus on there. And also like in the file, should the title be change log capital? Or change log, or changes capital, or changes. So this like this needs to be finalized so we can push it out. Mm. And then permission checks. Some of the methods, some of the methods uh, in Plone API go through permission checks. Some go around. Some emit events. Some don't. And it would be cool to have a consensus again. Uh, like should we go over over permissions or not? Should we emit events or not? Or should we support both and have a strict or a safe flag? for each of the methods. And then the big one, uh, the usage scope. Initially, we thought that Plone API will not go, should not go in core, and should only be used in integration projects. Because there are certain risks when you start using it in core, because Plone API was meant to cover 80% of the tasks that you do 20% of the time, the Pareto in principle. So it does not cover the entire functionality of Plone, only the basic ones. Um, but then I learned that people already started using Plone API in add-ons. And add-ons sometimes get into core. So we're kind of screwed there. Because if we allow a usage of Plone API in add-ons, we're going to smuggle it into core eventually. And then you would, you would be faced with, we need to rewrite this add-on to not use Plone API before it can get into core, which will not happen. And then we're going to have Plone API in core even though we don't allow it. So I think that we should actually discuss uh, using Plone API in core and what needs to be done to be able to do that. And uh, we're going to talk about it today, probably already on the open space at, f at 10 past 3 and surely on sprints. Me and David already looked at it a bit. It seems that there will be no, no circle dependencies, which is good, but I, we need more eyes to, um, to go through it and see if it's possible. If it's possible, it, sh it will be a great thing because then we're going to use less ZOAP in, in Plone Core and that means we can get rid of ZOAP more easily. Remove the dead body. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's all in the style guide. Yeah. So the sprint was, uh, sorry, the question was, the question was, I mean, the remark was that we need to update the skeletons and where is the canonical uh, place to s to look for information of how a good best practice should look like and yes it's all in the style guide how the file should be named how it should look like everything is in the style guide 
Even the git ignore, how the git ignore is okay to look like, everything is in there. Mr. Bob. We, need it. we really do need an ad, a, you know, second hand. You make the case, come talk to me. Cool. <laughs> yeah, next. More questions? Nope. Thank you. <laughs>